This presentation has to do with finding and processing native clay in the Southwest. And really, when we talk about Southwestern pottery, clay is really the foundation of everything. You can talk about firing techniques, you can talk about uh, painting uh, different forms of construction, but you're nothing without clay. It's really what it's all about. And clay is not only precious, but it's considered sacred by many. The Native Americans often pray or leave an offering of cornmeal before they dig clay from the earth. And we find that clay is really special in that uh, it's, it's very usable by mankind. It's uh, plastic and moldable when it's wet. When it dries, it hardens into that shape. And when it's heated, that shape becomes permanent. The other thing about clay is it's found almost everywhere in the world. So it really is something special. And many people do consider it a gift. The other thing about native clay as it relates relates to southwestern pottery is it connects the artwork to the land. So for example if we look at the pot in this picture here we might say that's a southwestern pot because the culture that created it came from the southwest but more than that the pot because its raw ingredients were taken directly from the land uh, the pot really uh, is a piece of the land it represents. So let's take a look at the qualities that make up clay. What is clay? Well, the dictionary tells us that it's a stiff, sticky, fine-grained earth, typically yellow, red, or bluish-gray in color, and often forming an impermeable layer in the soil. And this is fine, but what does it mean to an artist? Well, the technical definition tells us that it's sediment with particles smaller than silt. But still, that doesn't mean much to us because we're not going through and measuring each particle to see whether it meets the criteria to be clay. No, for a potter, Clay is really the qualities that make up the clay, the usable qualities of clay. And so let's see what some of those are. The first one we'll talk about is plasticity. Plasticity is defined as the property of clay that allows it to change shape without rupturing when force is applied to it. Plasticity of potter's clay cannot be measured by any scientifically repeatable test, so it's a bit subjective. The terms we use are fat for a more plastic clay and lean or short for less plastic clays. Now there's various properties that will affect the plasticity of a clay. The first one we'll talk about is particle size. The smaller the particles of clay, generally, the more plastic that clay body. The other item that affects plasticity is particle packing. So you've got all these particles and they're laying in there together. The tighter those particles are together, the closer they are to one to another, the more plastic. And that is because there's an electrical attraction between the individual particles. Um, and so the particle shape also influences this. So the more plate-like, the flatter those particles, uh, the tighter they're going to lay together, and the more plastic the clay body. Uh, another item that affects plasticity is organic matter. Now I'm not talking about leaves and sticks and roots. We don't want those in there. But that kind of organic soup, that muck you get at the bottom of a lake or a swamp, that will add to the plasticity of a clay body. Another item is aging. When we mix our clay up, we may wrap it up in plastic and let it sit for a couple weeks before we use it. And as it ages, that water soaks through all the little particles and helps it become more plastic. And the final item that uh, increases plasticity of clay is the pH level. Uh, it's been found that a slightly acid clay is more plastic. So uh, this especially affects us in the Southwest where soils tend to be alkaline. So Sometimes we add a little vinegar to our clay, it can help it be more plastic. Another one of those qualities we're looking at in clay is the shrinkage level. Now all clays tend to shrink. Uh, as, they, as they get wet, they expand, and as they dry, they shrink. Now we want that to be a manageable size. Some clays, like bentonites, have extreme levels of shrinkage, and so they're really unusable for forming pots out of because they tend to just crack when they, when they dry. So uh, shrinkage is one of the things we're looking for. Uh, now, shrinkage can be uh, modified by adding tempering. So as an aside, let me just explain tempering. Tempering is adding non-plastic materials to your clay body. It does a number of things, but one of the things it can do is reduce the amount of shrinkage and make it more manageable. Um, and so uh, when we talk about tempering, usually it's ground stone uh, or sand or ground pot shards, something that uh, opens up that clay body, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, another uh, quality of clay we're looking for is its porosity. Uh, the less porous the clay, the more thick and tightly packed it is, the, the more difficult it is for water and air to flow through that clay. So we want to open it up a little bit. And that, once again, is uh, where we're adding tempering, is opening up, making it more porous. 
and then it's going to dry more evenly. Uh, it's going to be able to handle thermal shock better. We're going to open it up a little bit. Um, the final uh, quality of clay we're going to talk about is wet strength. And uh, wet strength just means that the clay, once you've formed it into a shape you want, has the strength to stand up. So if you form a pot, it doesn't want to slump down. At the same time, wet strength can be extreme. Some clays are very firm and take a lot of, a lot of strength just to push them up into, into the shape you want. So we want some kind of a balance there where it's easily moldable and yet strong enough to hold itself up. So the qualities of clay we're looking for are plasticity, shrinkage, porosity, and wet strength. There are many others, uh, like color, for example, but these are the main ones we're looking for. Let's talk a little bit about the different types of clay deposits, where clay is found. And the first one of these is a primary or residual clay source. This is where the clay is uh, at the location where it is weathering from the parent material. The picture here was given to me by my, by my friend Tom Weiss, uh, who uses a lot of primary clays up in the Prescott, Arizona area. And you'll see uh, the parent material in the top right corner illustrated and then there's that bed of clay where he's digging, where it is weathering from the parent material. It hasn't eroded yet and been redeposited elsewhere. The next kind of clay deposit we're going to talk about is a secondary or sedimentary clay deposit. Now this is where the clay has already eroded from that primary source, where it came from, and been redeposited by water. Secondary clay sources are, in my area of southeast Arizona, much more common. They also tend to be more easily workable uh, than primary clays. The types of secondary clays that we generally find fall into a couple different categories. The first of those is a marine deposit. Marine deposits are those deposits that have been laid down by ancient seabeds. And these are real common up on the Colorado Plateau in northern Arizona, northern New Mexico. This particular picture is actually a marine deposit in uh, southwest Colorado. Uh, a type that's more common in my area is the alluvial deposit. And these are deposits that are laid down by uh, rivers. Usually you'll find these in riverbeds or on the margins of floodplains. Uh, and these will have a lot of organic matter in them. So well, now we're going to go out and look for clay. Uh, what does it look like? The thing is, the material we're used to seeing in our class uh, may look much different from what native clay looks like out in the wilds. So we're used to seeing maybe a, a plastic material in art class, but when you go out in the desert, it may look like a stone or like dirt. So we need to find out what we're looking for. And then you also need to be aware that it may require a great deal of searching to find a usable clay deposit. You may have to do some looking around for a while. Now, how do we find clay deposits? Well, one way is to ask other potters. Now, those of us that grow up in a, a pottery making community, uh, for example, uh, uh, one of the pueblos in New Mexico, or maybe even Mata Ortiz in Mexico, may learn from clay deposits from their family members who teach them how to make pottery but some of us aren't that fortunate. We've got to go out and find our own clay. One way to do that is to study maps. These aerial photographs that you can get on the internet are very useful. Uh, so for example, if we look at this aerial photograph, we've got, we've got a river valley flowing through the middle of it, and along that river we have floodplains, which is a good place to find alluvial clays. Uh, these deep arroyos that cut up through the, uh, above the river, we can see that they're deeply cut into the landscape. These would be a good place to look for strata for older maybe lake bed or, or uh, uh, marine deposits. So uh, also colors may help give us indications of uh, the type of clay we're looking for. If we're looking for a white or a red clay or something, then the colors on the maps may help us. Another type of map that can help us is these geologic maps that are available. And here's a couple of resources uh, for Arizona and New Mexico geologic maps that are available online. These are a good place to help you locate a, a sedimentary deposit, but also to locate, if you know where there is a good clay, but you don't have legal access to it, uh, using the geologic map, you be able, may be able to find another place where that same deposit crops up. So now we're ready to go out in the field. Uh, where are we going to look? Well, a good place to start your look is road cuts. Road cuts reveal the underlying strata of the land. And so in this picture, for example, we can see this horizontal strata in the hills by this road cut. And uh, I stopped and looked, and, and there is clay in there. Another good place is uh, arroyos. This particular arroyo is in near Tucson, near the Santa Cruz River. A great place to look is any place that you can see layers of strata. Uh, is always a good place to look because that tells us that this earth was laid down by ancient rivers or, or seabeds. So it's a good place where we may be able to find clay. 
Um, so what are we looking for when we're out in the field? Well, one indication is crackled earth. When we see this crackled texture on the ground, it tells us that the soil below it is expansive. That is, like clay, it expands when it's wet and shrinks when it's dry. So we know that the soil underneath this earth has a high clay content. That's a good uh, indicator. Another is when we get into the, the side of a bank, we see where it breaks into these uh, angular chunks. Clay tends to do that. Also, if you look here, you'll see there's a dark mineral patina on some of the faces of these angular chunks. This is another indication that we have clay. Another thing that often shows up to me are these bright colors or color changes. So like the green and the red in this particular bank drew me in from about a half mile away. And I walked in and sure enough, the green and the red were layers of clay. So color changes, uh, it's particularly bright uh, saturated colors are a good clue. Now, once we found some clay, how are we going to know if it's good to use? Well, I usually start with a plasticity test, and that means you just get the clay wet, roll it in your hands, squeeze it up, maybe form a coil and try to bend it and see if it cracks. Just see how plastic it is, and you can do this right in the field if you carry water with you. Another kind of test you may want to do is a calcium test. Now, here in the southwest, we get a lot of uh, calcium in the form of caliche or um, uh, limestone, and these are minerals that you do not want in your clay body. So if you think there may be a lot in there, uh, you can use a little bit of vinegar and just pour it right on the clay. And if it fizzles, that tells you that there's a lot of calcium in it. This is especially important when you're looking for white clay where caliche can hide. So a calcium test. Another test I often do is a shrinkage test. You want to see how much that clay is going to shrink. I just use a cookie cutter to chop out circles of clay like this and then just see how, let them dry and see how much they shrink. Then you can measure it against the original width and know what your shrinkage rate is. Then I take these tiles and I'll fire them and I'll see how they do in the firing, whether they warp or crack, or pop, uh, what colors they churn, these kind of things. So uh, I will do a shrinkage test and then a firing test with the same tiles. And, and once you're done with that, you kind of have a good idea what you're, what you're getting into and what comes out. The results of those tests might tell you how much you want to temper it or how you want to fire it. So that's pretty much how I go about finding good clay sources in the Southwest. The next presentation will go into processing that clay.